Okay, here we go. Welcome back to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. It's a double rainbow all the way. And Rish Outfield. Whoa, that's so intense. Get off my lawn. And welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 84. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Thanks for joining us. We've got a wonderful show for you today, including a story by a returning author, Mr. Christopher Fisher, who I believe he was on this show last year at about this same time with another dark and disturbing tale that was called On the Origin of Sounds. This year, we have the story entitled Tattletale. And now a word about the author. Christopher Fisher is a freelance editor with the editorial department and editor-in-chief of the journal Relief, a Christian literary expression, which publishes spiritual fiction, creative nonfiction, and poetry for a literary audience. He holds an MFA in creative writing from the University of Southern Maine, and his fiction has been honored with a Pushcart Prize special mention, among other awards. Tattletale, which is still one of his favorites, appeared in the 2006 anthology Thou, Thou Shalt, Shalt Not. Not by Dark Cloud Press, where it received an honorable mention in the year's best fantasy and horror, 2007. A native of Tulsa, Oklahoma, Christopher recently moved from southeast Texas to central Virginia, where he is relearning what it is like to live with seasons. We'd also like to thank Juliet Bowler and Rich Girardi for lending their voices to today's episode. Uh, today's music is by Mr. M and Dara Leach. And you can check out the links in the show notes. Tattletale by Christopher Fisher. Where are your children, Mr. Sparks? The officer stares down at the chair where I sit. But I don't answer him. When he and the three sheriff's deputies kicked in the front door just two minutes ago, I didn't even get up from my chair. I haven't said a word since. The officer must think I'm waiting for an attorney. But that's not it. That's not it at all. Where are your children, Mr. Sparks? He repeats in a typical East Texas drawl. I turn away, silent, and watch as two of the deputies start to rearrange the barricade blocking the entrance to the boys' room. The couch and sofa, the dining room table and chairs, the bed, desk, and dresser for my bedroom, even the refrigerator. Everything but this chair. It's all packed tightly in the hallway from wall to wall, from floor to ceiling like an overstuffed storage locker. The third deputy guards the front door either to keep me from getting away or to keep Anne from coming in. I see her through the window that overlooks the porch. She's alternating between chewing her hands and sobbing on Stan's shoulder. She called the cops, I guess, after I didn't answer the door when she came to pick up the boys. I'm sure Stan had something to do with it, though. Stan is fond of calling the police. Anne turns to me, sneering as our eyes meet. Then she screams, her voice muffled by the glass like it's coming from the big Tudor across the street. What did you do? What did you do with my children? I turn away, thinking her choice of words is rather funny. Six months ago, they were our kids. But not anymore. Now they don't belong to either of us. The deputies in the hall work quickly, like rescue workers. But it still takes them a good ten minutes to get through my barricade. They carry the smaller items into the living room and shove the heavier pieces against the walls, opening a narrow, jagged path to the boarded-up door of the boys' room. One of them starts working at the boards with a pry bar. I hear the crack of splintering wood, the screech of buried nails being yanked from the oak door frame. I nailed another layer of board beneath that one. But at the pace they're working, they'll be through it in no time. They continue prying and ripping, 
I can see most of the door now. One of them snaps off the last board with a stiff kick and knocks the door open with his shoulder. I don't even blink as they go inside. I know what they will find. After a brief moment, they come back out. The officer in front of me puts his hand on his gun before turning to look at them. They both shrug, and one of them says, Empty. There's no one in there. The officer returns to me. Do you know where your children are, Mr. Sparks? This time I pause. Yes, I can answer that one. I give a careful nod. Did someone take your children? Tears sting my eyes, and my breath comes in short gasps. I nod again. Did you see who it was? Do you know who took your kids? I feel a tremor in my top lip, and the words begin to rise. Then, I'm hit with the terror that merely thinking the answer is enough, and my jaw closes tight. But the name is still there, floating at the back of my throat. Because I want to tell. God, how I want to tell. I never liked old man Sipes. He never gave me a reason to. The first time we spoke was over the phone. The time he called at 4.30 in the morning to complain about my barking dog. This was before Anne left, and the small yard where we kept the dog was right outside our bedroom window. We hadn't heard a thing all night, so I couldn't understand how the barking, if there was any, could be bothering Sipes, who lived five houses down. Go back to bed or go to hell, I told him. I don't care which. Ten minutes after I hung up, I heard someone beating on the front door. Then the boys started crying in their room at the other end of the house. I stomped through the living room, ready to throw open the door and strangle the old man with my bare hands. But when I looked through the blinds, I saw two police officers. Sipes had called the cops on me. Over a dog. He did it again the next night, and the night after that. And though no one else on Sycamore Street ever complained... The police threatened me with a $200 fine for disturbing the peace if I couldn't keep the dog quiet. I could have bought an expensive shock collar. Business was good at the shop back then. But what good is a dog that can't even bark? I gave the dog to my brother, Dan. For two years after that, I didn't hear a peep out of Sipes. Occasionally I'd see him walking his little yipping poodle down the sidewalk, sometimes passing by, sometimes stopping to let the thing crap in my yard. But I never spoke to him. Not until that afternoon with the boys, just last week. Sparks Automotive had folded six months before, and Anne had moved out and shacked up with Stan, though our divorce hadn't gone through. Still hasn't to this day. My sons, Jacob, six, and Tyler, four, were visiting me for the weekend. That Friday afternoon, I was replacing the fuel pump in my Dodge while the boys rode their bikes on the sidewalk. They got away from me for a minute. Happens to the best of us. When I looked up, they were down the street in front of the Sipes' house, off their bicycles, and headed for his porch. I started down there to collect them, but Sipes beat me to it. He stepped out on the porch and yelled, Get! Then he chased the boys away with a broom like two stray cats. It took everything I had to keep from breaking that broom handle over the old man's head. Instead, I gathered the boys and their bikes and said plenty loud, Boys, that's just a mean old man. And you're a bad father, Sipes said. I should call child protection on you for letting them roam around by themselves. That got me. I was trying to get custody. I loved my boys, and if Sipes called the authorities on me, it would be the second time in just a few months. Not long after Anne first moved herself and the kids into Stan's place, I went over there to take the boys fishing, and Anne wouldn't let me have them. When I refused to leave, Stan came to the door like he was going to settle it. I poked two fingers in his chest. Stan, I've got reason enough not to like you. But if you try to keep me from my boys, you'll need a surgeon to put that pretty face back where it used to be. He didn't step outside and square off with me, like a man. He just dead bolted the door, called the police, and filed a formal complaint. A week later, Anne used that altercation to gain temporary custody of the boys until the hearing, leaving me with only a weekend visit at her discretion. 
Another visit from the police could destroy me in court, so I decided to beat Sipes to the punch, calling the police on him for assaulting my kids. All they did was take a report and talk to him, but at least I knew Anne couldn't use the incident against me. Still, Sipes had me fuming, which I guess had a lot to do with what happened later that night. I always encouraged my boys to work out their problems between themselves, but living with Stan the sissy had an influence. Jacob had started tattling on his younger brother over every little thing. Tyler tore a page in my book. Tyler opened my backpack. Tyler made a face at me. I'd heard this was normal, but I couldn't help thinking it was Stan rubbing off on him. I figured when Tyler got big enough, he'd get fed up and rattle Jacob's skull for it. But I was getting tired of waiting, sick of seeing the smirk of my wife's lover on the face of my son. That night... Just a few hours after Sipes swept my sons off his porch, Jacob came in the living room with that indignant look on his face. Daddy, Tyler threw my Thunderman at the ceiling fan. I don't know what came over me or where the idea came from. I pulled Jacob close, held a finger to my lips and whispered, Shh, I wouldn't be tattling if I were you. Jacob paused, the fire over his abused toy quickly cooling. Why? You know what happens to tattletales. He shifted his way to one foot. What? That mean old Mr. Sipes might hear you. And you don't want that. Why not? Because he'll come get you, is why not. No, he won't, because my daddy will beat him up before he gets in the door. I smiled. Oh, but he doesn't come through the door. He comes in through the ground, under your bed while you're asleep. How's he going to do that, with a back hole? I struggled to keep a straight face. Oh, no. He doesn't need a backhoe, because he's really a ghost. He's the devil's nightmare. He digs a tunnel from his grave in the cemetery, all the way across town if he has to, clawing at the dirt with his long, yellow nails, crawling through the worms and and the maggots, until he comes up underneath the bed of the tattletale. And then he snatches him and takes him away, back to his grave. And he keeps all the tattletales there with him, in the dark, deep down in the dirt, where no one above ground can hear them screaming. The house was quiet. I felt a wicked smile melt from my face, hardly believing what I had just said to a six-year-old, wondering why I had enjoyed saying it, in spite of the way it set my neck hairs on end. Jacob gave me a blank look, and I didn't know if he would laugh or cry. Finally, he smiled and pointed a tiny finger at me. (laughs) I know you're joking, Daddy. I started to laugh back, hoping that would break the spell for both of us. But from the corner of my eye, at the end of the hall, I saw the Thunderman toy drop from Tyler's hand and hit the hardwood floor. I had no idea he'd been listening. His little body trembled, And I'm sure that if I hadn't managed to smile right then, he would have wet his pants. But he saw the smile and ran to me, hugging me tight. I tried to take it back. I laughed and told them it wasn't true. But the look in Tyler's eyes told me it wouldn't help. Some words you just can't take back. Tyler was a believer and nothing I could say would change his mind. So I just kept laughing and hugging him, trying to lighten the mood, hoping he'd forget about it in a day or two. But later that night, the boys woke screaming in their bunk beds, and I had to let them sleep with me. Then, the next night, the same thing. I didn't bring up the story again, not even to insist that I had made it all up. I wanted them to forget about it, and that would never happen if I kept reminding them. When Anne came to pick them up on Sunday... I could still see the fear in Tyler's eyes, and even a little in Jacob's. I expected the next week would be a normal five days of repairing cars and waiting for Friday when I would see my boys again. I'd started working in my driveway, since the bank took my shop, and stayed pretty busy doing odd jobs. Tuesday morning, I started on a transmission that would pay just enough to cover the mortgage. A couple of hours into the job, I crawled out from under the car to stretch. Gazing down the street... Along the double row of live oaks and sycamores, I saw Mr. Sipes standing on his manicured lawn in front of his tidy yellow and white house, just staring at me. 
I figured he didn't like me working in the driveway and was cursing under his breath about sinking property values. But as I stared back at him, it wasn't anger I saw, it was nothing. Like his head was a dried up hollow gourd with a few dead seeds rattling around inside. I couldn't be sure because of the distance, but I thought I saw a shiny string of saliva dripping from his chin to his white shirt. I huffed and went inside for a sandwich and a beer. When I came back out, Sipes had moved to a chair on his porch, where he sat staring at the street until I finished for the day. I came out the next morning to finish the transmission, half expecting him to still be sitting there on the porch drooling on himself. But he was hobbling past my house with his poodle, that same idiot stare fixed on his face. Ten minutes later, he passed by on the way back. Then he came by again. He was trying to get a rise out of me, I figured, so I did my best to ignore him. But he kept walking up and down the sidewalk for almost three hours in the Texas heat, the little dog lagging behind on the leash, its tongue hanging out. At lunchtime, I stood and dusted myself off, watching him come down the sidewalk toward me. As he passed by, I said, Why don't you go inside before you have a stroke, you crazy old fart? He didn't look at me, just kept walking. About sunset, I finished and started cleaning up my tools. It occurred to me that I hadn't seen Sipes walk by for a while, and I thought he'd finally given up trying to annoy me. But when I looked at the sidewalk, he was standing there, just staring at the front of my house. The leash in his hand was limp. The dog lay on its side at the old man's feet, dead. Flies buzzed in the air above it. You sick, twisted freak! I started toward him. He slowly faced his house and hobbled away, dragging the dead dog along the sidewalk by its leash. I walked out to where he had stood, watching to make sure he went inside this time. He did, dragging the stinking dog through the door behind him. When I looked down at where Sipes had been standing, I saw a pile of fat white maggots squirming on the sidewalk. For the rest of the night, I couldn't get the images of that afternoon out of my mind, especially the maggots. I'd said something in the Sipes story about maggots and, and worms. Growing up in the South, it's nearly impossible to avoid going to church now and then. I remembered a preacher who spoke about the faith of a child, how faith like that could pick up a mountain in Montana and set it down right next to Galveston Bay. Then I remembered the look on Tyler's face, how he had believed so perfectly in the Sipes story, and the image of those maggots returned. Thursday morning, the phone rang, and I thought it was my tranny customer asking about her car. I'd forgotten to tell her I was done, but when I picked up the phone, it was Anne. What have you been telling our boys? I knew what she was going to say, but I tried to play it off. Now, come on, baby. Don't I even get a hello? Sure. Hello. What kind of crap have you been telling our boys? Jeez, it was just a story. A, a joke, really. Well, it's not funny. They've been having nightmares since Sunday, and Tyler is so afraid of the dark, he won't sleep without a flashlight. That hurt. The thought of my boy huddled beneath his blankets, sweating in terror I had invented. I wanted to punch myself in the face. I'm sorry, Anne. I didn't mean for him to hear. I only told Jacob to get him to stop tattling like a baby. That's another thing. I got a call from the school this morning. Jacob has been telling that story to his friends, and now the whole school is talking about the Sipes trial. Well, kids are gonna... I stopped. Did you say Sipes trial? Yes, that old story. What do you think I've been talking about? I... I, I don't know. I thought... What did she mean, old story? I'd made it up just a few days before. You, of all people should know better than to tell kids about that, if for no other reason than out of respect for Dan. Dan? My brother? Yes, Dan. Are you drinking? Are you drunk? I couldn't answer. Everything she said seemed to destroy the laws of physics, sloping the floor of the house upward, slanting the walls toward each other. Or maybe away from each other. You better believe all this is coming up in the hearing, she said. The phone clicked. I dialed Dan's number. All I got was a recording, saying the number was no longer in service. That couldn't be right. I'd just talked to him a few days before. I felt those sloping walls closing in on me, and the house started to feel strange. 
like someone else's home. I grabbed my keys to go for a drive. Outside, I felt it again. Everything in the yard was the same, but different. I heard a bark behind me and turned to the back gate. My dog, which hadn't been mine for two years, stood behind the fence, wagging its tail. I told myself that maybe I had been drinking too much. Maybe Dan had gone out of town and left the dog with me this morning, and I hadn't heard him knock. I sleep heavy on a few beers. But part of me felt I was just a shadow on a black and white screen, with an overdubbed Rod Serling talking about parallel universes. I shook my head and climbed in the truck, glancing at Mr. Sipes' house. My joints locked up like rusted pistons. My arteries filled with Freon. It was his house, but it looked like it had aged a hundred years. I cruised past for a closer look. The perfectly clipped grass was now a foot high. The windows were broken and the roof sagged. The white and yellow paint looked as if it had been sandblasted. The steps and railing around the porch were crumbling with termites and dry rot. A weathered sign on the door read, Condemned. And there was no sign of Mr. Sipes. I stomped on the gas and drove, having no idea where I was going or what I was looking for. I circled around town, up and down the business loop. When I saw the city library ahead, I realized what I needed was probably inside. I asked a woman behind the desk how I could read up on some local history. She showed me how to use a computer to search old newspapers. When she walked away... I typed in Sipes and hit enter. Then I spent the next three hours reading about a local urban legend that went back more than 30 years. The short version? Harold Sipes was a wealthy businessman back in the 70s who had a soft spot for fondling little boys. He'd molested dozens, threatening to torture and kill them if they ever told. You know what happens to tattletales, the paper had quoted him as saying. Those were my words. Three boys finally came forward, my brother Dan, one of them. There was a trial, and Sipes broke down in the courtroom, shouting that he'd kill the boys for telling, that nothing could stop him. Nothing. The judge gave him 20 years, but before they could transfer him upstate, he hung himself in the county jail and was buried in the local cemetery. The following week, one by one, all three of the witnesses, including 10-year-old Dan Sparks, who I remembered clearly as being my best man 18 years later, simply disappeared from their beds in the night. They were never seen again. I left the library and drove home in a daze. The story I told the boys sounded like the Cliff's Notes version of what I had just read. I imagined Jacob spreading my story around to his friends at school. I saw the lie growing, feeding like a living thing on each telling. I could see... how many? Fifty? A hundred? Maybe even 200 kids out there, believing and believing, making it more real each day. Worse, they were retelling it, filling in the gaps. And kids can be very imaginative. They had added other details besides the trial. Like the legend that the hole under the bed where Sipes comes in can only be seen when the lights are out. And the waves of vanishings that crop up every seven or eight years, this was also documented in the paper, though I had no memory of it, were really the old man coming out again. And if your neighbor's kid, or the girl who sits behind you in math, or one of the boys in gym class should happen to disappear one day, say it was aliens, say it was Santa Claus, say anything but Sipes, because you know what happens to tattletales. The next day, I was surprised when Anne showed up at the door with the boys. I thought after our fight on the phone that she would keep them, out of spite. But there was no anger in her eyes, at least no more than usual. It was as if the argument had never happened. Even the boys were different. They were so quiet. During dinner, I asked Jacob how things were at school. He shrugged and stirred a puddle of ketchup on his plate with a french fry. Maggie Reese wasn't there. Tyler's head popped up, his eyes wide. The comment made me a bit nervous, too, but I tried to keep things light. Oh, is she sick? Jacob shook his head. Been gone a week now. Tyler looked antsy like he had to pee. Oh, I said, thinking it best to leave it at that. But Jacob continued. Mrs. Fillmore said she must have gone to live with her daddy. Just then, Tyler snapped his face toward me and said in his timid four-year-old voice, It was Mr. Sipes, daddy. He took her. Jacob's hand lashed out like a broken fan belt, hitting Tyler in the mouth. 
Tyler fell from his chair and hit the floor wailing. I rushed over to pick him up. Blood and slobber spilled over his bottom lip. I shouted over Tyler screaming, Get in your room, Jacob! Jacob stood still, staring at Tyler. Go! Sit on your bed and, and wait for me! This time he ran from the dining room while I held Tyler to my chest, rocking him. After Tyler stopped crying, I sat him down in the living room and turned on a cartoon. Then I walked down the hall to deal with Jacob. He wasn't in bed when I opened the door. He sat, glassy-eyed, in the far corner, his legs spread open and his hands on his knees. I could see the fear in his eyes. Not fear of punishment, but something else. Why did you do that? He told, Daddy. Tyler tattled on Mr. S- <gasps> he cut the name short. That's just a story your stupid father made up. It's not real. None of it. Jacob lowered his head and stared at the floor as if he hadn't heard me. I walked out and slammed the door. I put them to bed at 9.30. Around midnight, they ran into my room screaming. Jacob, who slept on the bottom bunk, said he heard scratching underneath him like someone digging in the ground. I scolded him and told him to stop scaring his brother, but I let them sleep with me. The next day, I took the boys fishing. Out on Lake Caddo, the whole sight story seemed to evaporate in the sun. Tyler hooked a three-pound bass, though I had to help him reel it in. He was so proud. When we got back to the house, he made me take a picture of it to show his mom before I cleaned it and fried it. After dinner, we watched cartoons on the living room floor. Aside from Jacob's occasional glance down the hallway, it seemed as if old man Sipes had never existed. I didn't make them sleep in their room. When they fell asleep on the couch, I turned out the lights and went to bed. I dreamed of darkness. And somewhere behind the darkness, a sound. A faint rapid scraping, like a dog scratching at a door to be let in. The darkness took shape, a rough roundness, a tunnel. The sound grew louder, closer. There was a light up ahead, and blocking the light, a figure. I drew closer, right behind it, heard the frantic scratching, smelled the sour rottenness of dead fish. Ahead and above, I saw a pinpoint of light, a tiny hole, and something picking at it, scraping at it, covering and uncovering the light, and creating a strobe effect in the darkness. And the hole became bigger. Pieces of concrete came loose as bits of gravel, stones, then chunks, followed by splintered planks of oak flooring. Then light poured in, revealing withered hands, rotten hands, hands with skin like torn tissue paper, draping the bones and tipped with long, yellow nails. Through the widening hole appeared bed rails, slats, and a mattress. I sat up in bed. It wasn't the dream, but something else that woke me. A sound. I waited, and it came again, faint but distinct from the living room. Shh! Daddy! Jacob screamed. Daddy, he's taking Tyler, Mr. Sipeson! Another voice cut him off. A dry, raspy voice, like someone speaking through a mouthful of brake dust. But the word came through clearly enough. Telltale. Jacob screamed again. The sound rattled my eardrums. I jumped from the bed and into the living room. At the end of the hall, I saw a flash of movement as Jacob's kicking legs disappeared into the boy's bedroom. I ran down the hall, hearing the door slam shut, feeling the wind as I reached it. I threw my shoulder into the door, but it didn't budge. From inside, I heard both the boys now. They were screaming one word over and over. Daddy, 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 daddy! I kicked the door, punched it, slammed into it with all of my weight. But it didn't even rattle in the frame. It felt like a bulldozer was parked behind it. But I kept trying, screaming back at the boys. It's not real! Oh, God, I made it up! I made it all up! It isn't real! The boys' screams began to fade, became distant, vanished completely. I slid down the wall and collapsed on the floor, sobbing. After a moment, the door shook, seemed to loosen. I stood and tried the handle. It opened. Inside, I turned on the light and searched the room. The closet... The toy chest, the window, still locked from the inside. Then I looked under the bed. Nothing but a few worms and fat maggots writhing on the dusty oak floor. 
I looked up at the light switch, wondering if a tunnel would appear in the dark, thinking maybe it wasn't too late. Then I tried to imagine climbing down into that dank hole and going after them, crawling in the earthy darkness through miles of worms and maggots, and finally coming to the tunnel's end, coming to... I didn't turn off the light. I shut the door and boarded it up from the outside with two by fours and nails. Then I walled it up again. After that, I stacked furniture against the boarded door, moving everything until there was nothing else in the house I could cram into the hallway. Nothing but this chair where I sat down to wait. Mr. Sparks, do you know who took your kids? I give the officer the only answer I can. Silence. And I see the sad, knowing look in his eyes. And I know the name that is on his tongue, caged by those thin lips. Mr. Sparks, he finally says, I'm afraid you're under arrest. He starts to cuff me, reciting the lines I've heard on so many late-night movies. Apparently, I have the right to remain silent. And silent I will be. The attorneys, the interrogators, the head shrinkers and medical examiners, the jury, and even the judge as he passes sentence will all get the same answer. Not a single word. That's right. Mum's the word for me. Author's Note This story is one I wrote for a horror anthology titled Thou Thou Shalt Shalt Not published through Dark Cloud Press. The concept of the anthology was to take any of the Ten Commandments, break it, and see what happens. I decided to try the Ninth Commandment, Thou Shalt Not Bear False Witness Against Your Neighbor, partly because I figured everyone would be trying Thou Shalt Not Kill and also because it seemed a challenge to turn something as supposedly harmless as a lie into a child-killing monster. The anthology is still available on Amazon.com, wink, wink, and the story itself received an honorable mention in the year's Best Fantasy and Horror 2007. Interesting little tidbit, the Mr. Sipes character is based on an actual crotchety smart-ass neighbor who really did call the cops on me one night because my dog was barking. He also really did once chase my kids off his porch with a broom. The exchange between Sparks and Sipes in that scene is almost verbatim, though my neighbor and I never spoke to each other again after that. I have to admit, though, I took a sort of twisted delight in what I got to do to him in this story, and that's one reason this piece is, always in my mind, just as much a revenge story as it is horror. All right, welcome back, folks. I hope you enjoyed the story. I just realized that it's the month of October now. Yeah. And we should have been doing our scary voices. Oh. Which we'll, well, we'll get to next time. I'm sure people will miss that a lot. That's interesting. I didn't know there was a gesture for sarcasm, but you just made it. <laughs> How about that? All right, Ruti, do you, uh, do you celebrate Halloween in Robotsville or wherever you're from? All right, Ruti, uh, do robots celebrate Halloween? If I ignore him, maybe he'll go away. Okay. Announcer man, you excited about the Halloween season? Yes, sir. What are you uh, going to be for Halloween this year? Do you know yet? Uh... No. Okay. Well, it was a mistake. I'm sorry. <laughs> go back to uh, whatever it was you were doing. What is it you were doing? Guys, I'm just an announcer. All right. You. Good luck with that. Okay. So, Tattletale, a uh, unsettling story, I think. Yeah, I found that story to be creepy as frick, man. It had a lot of good mood in that piece. This sort of reminds me of the Broken Mirror stories that we got submitted this year because we have to have children do voices and then the the children also have to deliver a performance in this story, which is difficult. Yeah, it is. And when we were reading, when I was reading all those submissions, I kept thinking, geez, how would we possibly do this story? 
reject. 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 <laughs> it's like, this one is full of children. Reject. 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 This one, oh, the main character in this story is a child. Reject. Because reject. 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 there's no way we can do the kids' voices. And then you told me, what was your premise again? <laughs> it's like, oh, a child <laughs> is pronounced king or queen. So it was my own fault. I just, I hadn't thought ahead of how difficult it is to get a, a good child voice in a podcast. I, I'm thinking back, the only time I've ever heard children, actual, literal children, as opposed to figurative children, <laughs> I don't know what the opposite of literal is. The only time I've ever heard genuine children on a podcast doing voices, it's been us. Uh -huh. Whether Norm Sherman says, hey, can you get your kid to do this voice for my show or, you know what I mean? The rest of the time, it's always an adult doing a kid voice. Not that there's anything wrong with that. That's totally fine. Not that there's anything wrong with that. No, 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 no. But yeah, it's, it, the reason that nobody does it is because it's it's really hard. Yeah. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the performances of the children on today's show. We did our best. Well, uh, there was a podcast that was just made up of kids. Do you remember that? It was hosted by kids. The kids read the stories in it badly, and they performed it, and they introduced it, and they gave the little disclaimer at the end. But we're not going to mention that. We'll move on. <laughs> I thought that, that would be an interesting segue into a conversation. Okay, well, you tell me about Tattletale and what you, you liked about it. Did you... I don't know what it was. It was just really creepy. There was just kind of a lot of really tense, interesting mood to it. It seemed almost like the kind of story that I could have written myself. You know, the father's the main character, and he's he's doing everything to protect his children, except that he somehow unleashed this whole thing to begin with by telling this stupid story to get his kids to stop tattling. I guess it was the belief of the children that completely transformed the world, and this Mr. Sipes guy who goes from just being the cranky old man down the street that yells at the kids for being on his lawn. He goes away completely and just becomes a specter, a, a ghost, a story told to children to frighten them. And adults. Yeah. I genuinely was afraid. Christopher came up with a a really terrifying concept for a monster, for a boogeyman kind of thing. And, and, and maybe it is just the boogeyman, the thing under your bed or in your closet or in your head, exit light. Uh, <laughs> the thing that comes for children at night, just to me, that is endlessly scary. Uh -huh. Partly because we've all been kids. We've all been afraid of the dark or afraid of what might be standing at the foot of the bed. Now, some of us never outgrew that fear. And so that was one of the reasons this just rocked for me. I was just like, wow. I, but it's not just the kids that are afraid. The father is also afraid, but yeah. not necessarily for himself, but for his children. And that may be worse. I, I don't have kids. Because you're gay? No, 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 not because I'm gay. I just don't have kids. Uh, but you do. Uh-huh. And correct me if my, I'm, I'm wrong. Somebody putting a gun to your head is scary, but somebody putting a gun to your child's head is much more scary. Yeah, it is definitely much worse. And in the end, though, he just has to let the kids go. He knows there's no way he can save them. And they're taken away, and he's not in boy, no way in hell he's going down that tunnel to <laughs> try and bring them back. And he becomes so afraid that he won't even tell the police what has happened or his ex-wife who he is obviously on the outs with um, and doesn't feel like he owes her anything but uh, they were her children as well and they've been taken by the boogeyman but he won't tell on them on the boogeyman because then the boogeyman will be after him mm, I, you know I hadn't even really thought of it that way I mean obviously that's what happens in the story but yeah it didn't occur to me that yeah he's just afraid for himself there at the end and I guess that's that could be considered cowardly. That could be considered weak. Our weaknesses are what make us human, folks. Good night. <laughs> Thanks for listening. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published. No, uh, no, the other thing that I thought was totally interesting, you just touched upon the power of believing in something to the point where it becomes real. And I don't know what your personal beliefs are about X, Y, or Z, particularly Z. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think everybody would admit that there is a power in belief. 
you know, faith healers and the belief that, that, that something can help them, something that won't help them. Some, you know, the, the power of positive thinking, the yeah. power of the power love. of a placebo. Don't take money. Don't take fame. Don't need no credit card. To ride huh? this this train, you Mark, guys singing again? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you, announcer man. I once you get me started. Yeah, I was gonna say is that that's got to be at least the second song you've quoted since we started. And it shan't be the last, folks. Turn it off now while you still can. Good night, folks. I've been fascinated with that idea of if somebody believes in something enough that it could come true. Now, usually it's it's a horror type scenario i guess you can go back to jm barry though you know i i do believe in fairies you know uh -huh. clap your hands if you believe in fairies and, full on uh, double rainbow i've been in a room where you clap your hands and cry and you want tinkerbell to come back to life and all the way you know that she's not a fairy you know that she's just an actress on the stage and that she's not really dead and yet there's some kind of wave of belief of, of audience participation that happens in, on, in, in performing Peter Pan. I, I told you before about that I always get emotionally involved in plays, much uh -huh. more than in movies or books or anything. But yeah, that's certainly the case. And, and I don't know that I've ever admitted that to anybody, but just the tears rolling down your face as you're clapping your hands, <laughs> saying that you believe in fairies. It's uh, starting to look like a triple rainbow. You know what? Maybe I am gay. <laughs> You're clapping your hands going, I believe in fairies. I do, I do. I'm the dream maker. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you know, I've written stories before uh, about that, and I've read other stories. And there's this show on uh, the CW called Supernatural. And I've watched the whole first season. And sometimes the show can be good. Sometimes it can be really mediocre. But the best episode in that first season was about a house that was reputed to be haunted and it was covered on an internet show about, you know, we're going to take a camera crew in there and tell you about the history of the house. It was a popular internet show and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people would go to this site and read and watch about these urban legends, about these, the, you know, the, this haunted house, this site where something awful happened. And, and the idea of that episode was that with all these hundreds of thousands of people reading it, these things started to come true. The house was just an ordinary house. And these guys had made up this story about this awful thing that had happened, you know, 50 years ago. And the curse that was on the house that keeps affecting people today. And it started to happen because so many people so believed that it was true. I thought, wow, what an awesome idea. And the way that they defeat this thing is that they change the story so that people start believing that this thing has a vulnerability and then they're able to take it out using that <laughs> vulnerability. It was a brilliant episode of a show that varies between mediocre and pretty darn good. And I just thought about that when I read this story of just the, the force, the strength of believing in something. And, and, you know, there are people that are so superstitious or so fixated on something, whether religiously or I got a bad tarot reading or, or whatever that they can think themselves into illness, that they can think themselves to death. Yeah. There's uh, plenty of hypochondriacs out there that do that illness type thing. The, the, the other thing that this reminded me of, I mean, I'd, I'd really rather you talk, but <laughs> sorry, I'm kind of sleepy. I'm not on it today for some reason. The other thing that this reminded me of is uh, when I was a kid, uh, a nightmare on Elm street came out. That was a boogeyman for my generation, for the, what did uh, Dean Wesley Smith call my generation? The crappiest generation. I think it's the opposite of the greatest generation, whatever that No, no that is. was Tom Brokaw that called us the shittiest generation. Oh, oh. Uh, Dean Wesley Smith called us the entitlement generation. Ah, okay. But for my young, impressionable mind, this Freddy Krueger character, the, 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 the being, the ghost, if you will, that is alive in your dreams and can hurt you was really scary and really original, and it spoke to me. And, of course, they diluted it. But recently they came out with, like, a 25th anniversary DVD, and, and I watched it again for the first time in years. And it was watching it from adult perspective, uh, suddenly I felt like the film was a lot about the secrets that people keep from one another, the generation gap between parents and children and 
the sins of the fathers being visited upon the children. Yeah, I think uh -huh. I saw that on a bumper sticker sometime. Oh. These parents had done a bad thing, and then they just tried to hush it up, and then it came back to bite them, but not necessarily on themselves, but on their kids. Uh -huh. And it really upset me. The, the character of, of Nancy Thompson is trying to express to her parents what's going on, and they won't believe her, even though... They are at fault. They are they were there from the very beginning. They know that there was a Fred Krueger uh -huh. and, and all that stuff. Yeah, for some reason, it hit me in a totally different way than it had as a little boy, uh -huh. but in a very powerful way. Of it, It's your own fault that your children are being terrorized, that they're dying. Tell the truth. Come clean. Admit what you've done and fix it. it, it but the denial is just horrible. And, you know, that's one interpretation uh, for A Nightmare on Elm Street and... Another would be just, you know, a, a silly, dumb slasher movie. But it was interesting to suddenly have this perspective that I never had before. And it, it certainly occurred to me during Tattletale that this is the, the father's fault. Yeah. He came up with this idea, this this story, a really scary story. But, but one that is relatable, that's not supernatural at all. Well, it is supernatural, isn't it? Because because the guy's dead and he comes back. Right. But then he creates this thing that affects untold number of lives, including the lives of the people he cares about the most. And I don't know. I think that'd make a hell of a movie if you could uh, transform this Sipes into a. I don't know. We we need a boogeyman again. Yeah, I was a new watching one. instead of a remade old one. Right. Well, you know <laughs> that, that's a big thing right now is just the remakes, but. I think one of the reasons that that Nightmare on Elm Street series made so much money in the 80s was because it was unique. It was different than what the other studios or production companies or whoever made horror movies in the 80s were doing, which was basically just ripping off Halloween. Let's make Halloween over and over again. Let's make our version of Halloween. And uh, I was watching with my cousin the Hammer Dracula series recently, and I thought, gosh... Why do they not make a series of movies about Dracula again like they did? Because he's in the public domain. Anybody could do it. I think all we've got that comes year after year are those damn Saw movies. Oh, right. And I guess Jigsaw is a boogeyman of you know for the 21st century, but there's room for more. I don't know. I'm on a tangent, and I didn't mean to. Let me Let me come up with another song lyric to get us back on the page, if you will. It's interesting, though. I, we were talking about belief and how belief can make things happen. And you were talking about hypochondriacs and stuff like that. And I think, especially with supernatural things like this, it's much more a matter of whether you believe or not. Did you tell, on the air, did you tell your story about your uncle and his house? Or was that only in your blog? Yeah, I don't believe we've talked about it on the show, should we? I was going to mention that. You you have an uncle, right, that you would consider being a believer, someone that has had experiences or at least professes to have had experiences with ghosts. Yeah, we've talked about that on the air before. Yeah, he, so he has had multiple experiences that are unexplainable or at least unexplained. And, and if you choose to interpret them in a supernatural way... Like he does, you sh you totally can. Right, and this same uncle has now moved into a house which he got. It, it, it totally. It's so funny that this is a true story because it sounds so much like the beginning of some horror movie that you've probably seen at least ten times. But he needed to move out of his house because he couldn't afford the rent anymore. He found a nice big house. The rent was really, really low on this house and amazing that he could get such great rent. And so he moves into this house and discovers that the reason the rent was so low is because nobody wanted to move in because the people that lived there before, one of the sons, there was an um, old lady and her two adult sons. One of the sons went crazy one night. He goes upstairs, kills his brother, then goes back downstairs and kills himself. And then the mom was the only one left in the house. And she's now moved out, not to a home, as he'd originally thought when he heard the story of the house being cheap, but to more like a uh, asylum because of uh, the uh, trauma that she went through with her boys. And so now he's moved into this house. 
And this is somebody who believes already in supernatural stuff, and now he's moving into a place like this. And you said that he had some kind of weird thing go on with his iPod or something like that, where it flashed back to some other date. Yeah, I think it went to July 20th, 1969. The date went, and there was all this static on it. And he thought, wow, why would an iPod even have 19 built into it for its its date kind of thing? And I, was just, and I said, John, I'll bet if you did some research, you'd find <laughs> out that that date has some significance, July 20th, 1969. Probably the birth date of the one who went crazy or something like that, or who knows. Yeah, it's... yeah. We, now, we didn't talk about this on the air, although it would have been really cool if we had, because just this week I found out that that happened two years ago, the murder-suicide. Uh-huh. And after the woman had her breakdown and went off to, to a home, the landlord moved into the house um, and just was uh, freaked out. I don't know the details, but the <laughs> landlord himself moved out of the house immediately. And that's why it was put up for such a cheap price is that he's like, geez, I can't even live in this place. <laughs> and so I, you know, I haven't really asked John about it if, if he's talked to the landlord and what the landlord experienced. But, you know, the Amityville house. They only lived there for eight days, you know. And it's just like they walk in the door and get out. <laughs> the, apparently that's the, the sound of the doorbell. Somebody's recorded yeah. get out. As the doorbell, and that's that's not a good sign. But. Oh yeah, that just cracks me up. And I remember when you told me the story the first time, and then you were just like, you you were just gleeful in expectation of what is going to happen. You're not worried about your uncle. You're just excited to find out what is going to happen. You're like, oh, it begins. Okay, then <laughs> that makes me a bad person. And if you're a new listener to the show, then that may come as a surprise to you. Not to me. Uh, thank you. I, you know, I'd forgotten he was even here. Yeah. I, I, I tried to hang a coat on him. <laughs> and, him in. and, you know, I don't want something bad to befall my uncle. But there's something powerful and fun and exhilarating and entertaining about a good ghost story. About a, this really happened to me uh -huh. kind of story. And he, my uncles tell these stories that are just great. And so I do look forward to hearing <laughs> his story. I mean, the, the iPod one is pretty weak, right. admittedly. But yeah, it was a five-bedroom home going for less than his two-bedroom condo was going for. And it has a garage and a front yard and a backyard and a basement and a second floor and an attic. Uh, just and what's in that attic? Well, that's the thing is when they were first moving in, I went over there. I don't know that I expected. Get up. Right. I, I, I guess horror movies had conditioned me to expect a bad feeling or a bad experience when I went over there. Now, he knew what had happened with the house before he, they moved in. Uh -huh. But he moved in anyway. And in my opinion, that makes things way worse if there are ghosts, if there are forces of the supernatural. Because it's just like, hey, you knew then and you did nothing. Now, do you believe in ghosts? Do you believe that there's likely to be such a thing? Or is this something that you're ambivalent about? You think maybe? Are you a believer? I don't know that I believe, but I definitely don't disbelieve. Uh, well, there are definitely, uh, unequivocally, things that we can't explain. That, yeah, that's definitely true. And whether it is the house settling, whether it is... A glimpse into another dimension, whether it is your overactive imagination tricking you into seeing something right there in the corner of your eye, or in John's case, right in front of him. I believe that that stuff is possible, but I don't want to put a label on it and say this plus this equals ghosts. This plus this equals afterlife. This plus this equals I pray to Shiva, let me die. But I do not. Now the evil of Kali take me. You know, just I, I don't want to say for sure this is this. Right. For, but, but I am willing to say I don't know. Yeah. It does seem, though, that the more credence you give things like that, the more you believe, the more likely it is that you're going to have ghosts or run into ghosts or be involved in something like that. Which may, I guess, give some power to the idea that you know this is all in your imagination because somebody who doesn't believe doesn't see but you who believe do maybe there's that i don't know no no i i totally agree with that and that's what you were going with the reason we even brought up john's story and you know i wish i had told about it 
when it first happened, and then I could keep doing updates. And well, stuff. we still can. There's more to come, but, I'm sure. But his brother, Len, is the one that ha usually has the scary ghost stories. Now, John is a believer in the supernatural, but as a sort of life-affirming force. And I know I've told before that he has these dreams, that his mother, who's died, comes to him, and she gives him advice, or she mentions something that's about to happen, and then it does. But this is a benevolent ghost, if uh -huh. you will. His older brother, Len, though, he's the one that tells the stories that makes your straight hairs turn curly. What happens to your curly hairs? They turn white. Hmm. Unless you're an albino, in which case they turn bright carrot top red. But he, he has these just awful, awful stories of a sinister, malevolent afterlife kind of force kind of thing. And in, in his stories, they are entertaining, like I said. And nobody can spin a yarn like he does. But he's the one that I've, I've mentioned. If, if the things that he says have happened to him happened to me, I would be in the loony bin right next to that <laughs> mother. Our theory has always been either he was born more susceptible with an, a sixth sense, if you will, of, of seeing the, seeing the other people. side or his willingness to believe in evil spirits and such has made his mind's eye interpret the things that he sees in the framework of evil spirits. And I know from my personal experience that I'm one of those people whose mind can betray them. Uh -huh. Your thoughts betray you. I can convince myself that something awful is there. And my brain will be like, oh yeah, check this out. And there's something there and then it's gone. But my pants have already beshat themselves. <laughs> and, and so I, when I went over to John's house for the moving in party or whatever, I waited. I looked around every corner. Uh, we went to the downstairs hall and there was a door that was open at the end of the hall and you could see the light falling onto the hall. And I waited for something to cross in front of that light. <laughs> you don't see what made it, but something made a shadow. I think if I s went over to house sit by myself, You'd start seeing these I, things. I think so. And that's the mentally unstable part of my great brain. Like, for example, my uh, other uncle, he was checking on the wiring. And so he showed us the crawl space above the house. <laughs> and now, dude, if there's ever been a word just fraught with ominousness, not that that's even a word, it's crawl space. But ominousness is not. I don't think it is. But, you know, he was working on the wiring and it was something up in the attic and it was just this long stretch, like a hallway up there, but with a very triangular ceiling. And I thought, okay, this is going to be a really scary place because it's just filled with shadows and little places where creatures can be hiding or little faces can be peering out. And then he said, do you want to check out the crawl space? And my nuts went away. But I went up the stairs and I looked and there was nothing there. I, I expected there to be. Yeah, yeah. On the tour, John showed me, this is the room where it happened. And they hadn't moved. And there was they were using that room for rug. storage. There was a rug in one spot where the uh, blood stain was, maybe? No, but I just... Oh, wait, no, it has new carpet, doesn't it? Oh, probably. Ah. But they, they weren't using that as a bedroom. So surely John is covering his bases, I guess. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. But... But, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night because you have to urinate or you're thirsty or you heard a sound and you walk down that hall and you just happen to glance as you're walking and there's a guy sprawled out on the bed and the wall is spattered with blood. Or there's somebody standing there grinning. These are these are possibilities. These are things that I see <laughs> that would prevent me from ever house-sitting over that house. <laughs> and I'm sure that most of it is my own fault. If you're an atheist or, or a diehard agnostic or whatever, and you're listening to me right now and thinking, oh, what a jag off. You may have a point there. But if, if you're not, if you're a believer in that sort of thing or the kind of person that would go visit psychics or, or, or whatever it might be, then maybe you're calling me a jag off there too. Now, maybe Pretty much everyone's calling you a jag off. Oh, wait, OT, what do you call him? Jag off. See? Mm -hmm. If but, only we got an announcer man to record the word jag off, he would call you that too, but... But he's gone. If, if you were a believer in one of those things, then maybe you'd say, well, no, you're wise to not go over there because you have an imagination or you're susceptible. Or maybe that's all that it takes 
for the veil to be thin. You know, it's just somebody that expects something to be there, like the hypochondriac. Right. Anyhow, I hear of the symptoms and you will start to cough. That's like when I yawn, you have to yawn. Yeah, and I'm kind of tired already, too. That's Okay, well, then we will end this episode. We've been recording for a little while. Thank you, Christopher Fisher, for sending us another story. I think you're really good at what you do. Yes, it was a wonderful story. Thanks a lot for that. And now, a word from our sponsors. Hey, speaking of evil robot monkeys. Eh? We did uh, that promised reading for the Drabblecast that I, I mentioned a couple weeks back. Oh, right, yeah. Norm had another of his trifectas. I think this one is trifecta 69. He jumped directly from 14 to 69. I, well, I would you too. know, who wouldn't? And uh, what, what is it that we recorded? Do you remember? It was Toaster of the Gods. Does that sound familiar to you now, Rish? No? Terrible? Okay. No, no, no. I, I remember reading it. I was just, <laughs> this is for the benefit of somebody who maybe hasn't listened. I, to I was just mocking. mocking. Taking the piss out. How dare you, sir? Yeah, we did the Toaster of the Gods, which was the third of the three stories in Trifecta, following Super Evil Robot Monkey Team, Team. Go. And we came after that. Okay, so that's at the Drabblecast right now. Yeah, check it out. It's already up. It's ready to go. If you love Dune, Steve. Wait, is this script wrong? If you like good fiction, go to the Drabblecast. Yeah, that makes more sense. You can even suffer through more Dune, Steve readings. Plus, everybody's got nipples. That's right. And speaking of nipples, <laughs> we did uh, a reading for Julie Hoverson. You are not going to do that. Yes, we did do a reading for Julie Hoverson. Wait, you're going to leave that in? <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Speaking of 69, oh, we, we, okay. we recently did a... <laughs> we did. We recently did an episode of someone else's podcast. And we're not going to talk about that one right now. Instead, we're going to talk about 19 Nocturne Boulevard, which we also did an episode of. Yes, yes. This one was... Uh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Speaking of 60... No, oh, folks. <laughs> this is, this is uh, 19 Nocturne Boulevard. We did The Naked Truth, right? There you go. Right. That was the episode. Speaking of... Right. <laughs> yeah, see? Now you're doing it. You've become what, I what most you despise. most despise. Julie Holverson has a podcast, and I'm sure we've talked about it, and we'll talk more about it next episode. But her podcast is audio drama, like old-timey slash modern... No narrator, just actors. Acting! Brilliant! Thank you! <laughs> this one was called The Naked Truth. And here's the weird thing. And not not weird, but odd. And, and not necessarily odd, but but unusual. And, and, you know, not necessarily unusual either, just upsettingly strange. Julie writes all of these herself. Very quickly. She does two episodes a month and does it all herself and is prepared like six months ahead of time. Well, see, Julie wasn't born a woman as you and I were. Say what? Julie was created in a lab oh, by yeah. Dr. Mangala. And, oh, okay, oh I was going to guess that she's spraying fully formed from the head of Athena. Or wait, no, was Athena that's spraying fully formed from the head of Zeus? I don't know how that works. I'm, it was uh, Julie Hoverson. So oh, it was Julie. Oh, goddess of wisdom. Goddess of audio drama. But yes. Or, or as your wife would say, <laughs> drama. drama. Yeah, that's yes. right. Naked Truth, he, Big and I did voices on there. Now, I can't really remember. I did like the king, the Mr. emperor. Mr. Emperor, Mr. I believe you were. Good, good. Your podcast has made you powerful. Now fulfill your destiny and claim your Parsec Award at the... Oh, that still hurts, the whole Parsec. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow. I play yeah. Mr. Emperor. It's just like a film... Uh, an old time, yeah. You were a film director. The whole thing is set in kind of like a '30s Hollywood setting, kind of a thing. And Rish plays the director who uh, yells a lot. You played a thug. No, yeah, I played like kind of the the street hood with the uh, typecasting. Just like Steve Buscemi, I've been typecasted as the big dumb galoot as usual because it just fits so well. They, everybody knows I can pull that off and nothing else. So. So, yeah, check that out. It's 19, the number 19, Nocturne Boulevard. Jesus, how do people... S okay, N-O-C-T-U-R-N-E-B-O-U-L-E-V-A-R. Boulevard. You didn't say the D at the end. Damn it. It's okay. We'll just cut that. We can cut now that Now there's the Asian kid. We can... <laughs> 
<laughs> we can cut that whole part out and just say, check out the link in the show notes. Ah! That could have been good, but it sure wasn't. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode, and we'll see you again next but, time. But, oh, before we say goodbye, our October scary story is still going. Just send us a scary story before, before like, November 2nd or 3rd. Send it to submissions at doonstief.com and mention that it's an October scary story. It just has to be a scary story that you write during the month of October. And good luck with that. That's right. you got a few more weeks to go. So uh, enjoy the writing of that story. See you later, folks. Happy Halloween. See you later, everybody. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Cheers, guys. Take two. Where are your children, Mr. Sparks? You want to put on more drawl on that one? <laughs> I... <laughs> Where, where are your children, Mr. Sparks? Holy crap. Is that a real accent? I have no idea. Just imagine a cowboy saying it. I did. Take two. You want to put on more drawl on that one? <laughs> where are your children, Mr. Sparks? Holy crap. Is that a real accent? I have no idea. Do you know who took your kids? I don't want your life. My sons, Jacob 6 and Tyler 4, were visiting me for the weekend. That yeah. for <laughs> Give a pause between their name and their ages just to... Uh, it sounds like their name is Jacob 6 and Tyler 4. I am Jacob 6! And I am Tyler 4! And together, we are Robot Hero Monkey Team 10! I'd heard this was normal, but I couldn't help thinking it was Stan rubbing off on it. Ew. I remembered a preacher who spoke about the faith of a child. How faith could... The, 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 how Do that again without the <laughs> over-the-top accent. Why? That's what a southern preacher sounds like. I know, but it's just too much for, for that bit. It's not supposed to be a funny thing, but it comes across as funny. Thursday morning, the phone rang, and I thought it was my tranny customer... <laughs> I thought it was my transsexual customer calling about their genitals. Thursday morning, the phone rang, and I thought it was my tranny customer calling about her. How how do you say tranny when you're not referring to transsexual? Same way, tranny. <laughs> okay. And and maybe it is just the boogeyman, the thing under your bed, the the thing that comes after children. Oh, so. God, come on, man. Oh, there comes that static. You know, it's always something. I, I, I'm, I'm in the middle of something. I told you about when my cousin was over at the house and she and my niece just kept making noise and running around and screaming and shrieking. And I, I had to record something. It was a deadline and I practically missed it. So finally I had to tell them, hey, can you please just go outside? I, you know, I'm recording something. Just go outside for, for 10 minutes and I'll have it done. And so they went out front and my cousin started to ring the doorbell again and again, uh, I, I, uh, my cousin rings the doorbell repeatedly or somebody <laughs> calls on the phone or uh -huh. the dog starts going ah, 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 for no reason. Wait, this isn't that gets my goat. But yes, I hate that uh, static. And John gave us the tour of the house. You actually missed the, the scare, uh, a earwig. An earwig jumped out at him while he was in that crawl space and it was pretty horrifying. Okay. We can cut that whole part out and just say, check out the link in the show notes. Ah, do you really want to cut it out? I think this is no, you comedy can, gold. You can leave it in. You can leave me saying we'll cut it out and just say, check out the link in the show notes. Etc. cetera. Et cetera, et cetera. Why are we still recording? I don't know. Remedy it! You've made worms meet of me. And so, adieu. Uh, ooh. Evil robot monkey team. Monkey. <laughs>
Hey, speaking of evil robot monkeys. Eh? I, I don't know. I just thought that no, would you be weren't good. speaking of evil robot monkeys. What are you saying? Shh, 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 shh. No one was paying attention anyway. That's right. And speaking of nipples, <laughs> we did uh, a reading for Julie Hoverson. Oh, you are not going to do that. Yes, we did do a reading for Julie Hoverson. Wait, you're going to leave that in? <laughs> okay, we'll 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 record another. No, no, let's, so let's that we leave don't... it. That's pretty funny, right? <laughs> or not? It is funny. Hopefully, uh, she would take it as such. And not take it as utterly offensive. <laughs> okay, well, what do you think? Uh, I don't know, man. Oh, okay, so I've just said speaking of nipples and now say something to clear the palate. Whoa, whoa, that's what, what? Uh, going a little too far. I, okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Speaking of 69, oh, we, okay. we, we recently did it. <laughs> but her podcast is uh, like old timey. Uh, audio dramas, you know, no narrator, just acting. Brilliant. Brilliant. Oh, you didn't even let me. I'm sorry. I just farted. Um, <laughs> ah! Dueling <laughs> sphincters. <laughs>